Okay. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Tokyo Tech Research Showcase 2022. I am Tachiya Mizukoshi, the director of Tokyo Tech Annex Bangkok. Before starting, I will give you some notices. First, uh, about Q&A. Please write your questions in Q&A on the Zoom toolbar. Be aware that it may not be possible to answer all questions due to time constraint. And about today's video, this event will be recorded and will be opened later on NASDAQ and Tokotech website. About questionnaire, we will email the link to the questionnaire. So please answer it and you will get the password to today's materials. And Tokyo Tech Research Showcase is organized by Tokyo Tech Annex Bangkok, co-sponsored by Tokyo Tech and NASDAQ and supported by Tokyo Tech Alumni Association Thailand. If you have any uh, opinions, comments, please contact to the following email and our phone number. So this is uh, today's program. Uh, three sp speakers from Tokyo Tech and one guest speaker from NASTA. Okay, then uh, we shall move on to the opening remarks. First, Professor Junichi Takada, Tokyo Tech Vice President. Then Professor Takada, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Tokyo Tech Research Showcase. Uh, I'm Junichi Takada, the Vice President of International Affairs at Tokyo Institute of Technology or Tokyo Tech. And uh, <clears throat> This is uh, the fourth research showcase, and uh, uh, this is organized at the annual event. So it's already the fourth year to have this event. But uh, due to the restriction under the COVID pandemic uh, for these two years, uh, we are not able to travel between Thailand and Japan. But uh, this showcase uh, is organized via online, and uh, we appreciate uh, for your participation. And even under this such difficult situation, uh, we try to promote the cooperation uh, between Tokyo Tech and NASDA and to contribute to the progress of science and technology. Uh, we are running Tokyo Tech uh, master program for 15 years uh, in cooperation with NASDA and uh, top universities in Thailand to produce the advanced researchers and engineers. And in cooperation with these programs, uh, since last year, we have organized two uh, mini workshops uh, covering those fields. And also the researchers of Tokyo Tech and NASDA are preparing for the application to the East Asia Joint Research Project, E-Asia JSP. East Economic Corridor of Innovation, uh, EECI, uh, is promoted by Thai government as an innovation hub. And uh, <clears throat> Tokyo Tech is uh, very strong in the research field covered by uh, EC EECI, in particular the Aripolis uh, project, I mean the automation, robotics, and intelligence systems platform. Therefore, uh, we have chosen the topic uh, of this uh, showcase as the automation, robotics, and intelligence systems, uh, which is identical to the field of Aripolis. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we'd like to contribute uh, to this showcase uh, for, uh, to these fields. And we invited three speakers uh, in Tokyo Tech. Uh, they are all from the Academy for Super Smart Society uh, dealing with this field. And we also have the guest speaker, Dr. Jarwat, uh, Jarwat, sorry, the pronouns uh, uh, inaccurately, uh, from NASDAQ. And we wish uh, this showcase can be an opportunity for the joint research uh, with the Thai industry. 
And I appreciate for uh, continuing support from uh, NASDA uh, as a co-sponsor. And uh, I appreciate uh, Dr. Chadamas and uh, colleagues uh, for this arrangement. And uh, also uh, Tai Kuramae Kai, our Alumni Association of Tokyo Tech in Thailand uh, as the supporter. So I wish this event uh, is a good opportunity for your further collaboration. And thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Takada. Next, uh, Dr. Chadamas Tubasataku, a NASA Executive Vice President. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kushi san uh, Professor Takada, distinguished speakers and distinguished participants. Good morning, everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome everyone to the 2022 Tokyo Tech Research Showcase on behalf of the National Science and Technology Development Agency, or NASDA. It is a great honor for NASDA to be a co-host of this event. As Professor Takada mentioned, NASDA and Tokyo Tech has developed a close relationship through the Thais Tokyo Tech program, which is an international graduate program to produce world-class researchers and high-level engineers at master's degree level. Thai's Tokyo Tech program has been operated for 15 years and has produced more than 450 graduates to work in industry, universities, and government agencies in Thailand. The program is a tripartite partnership between NASDA, Tokyo Tech, and Thai universities, namely Sirinthorn International Institute of Technology, Thammasat University, Kasetsat University, King Mongput uh, Institute of Technology, Ladrabang, and King Mongput University of Technology, Thonburi, and Mahidon University. And for the academic year, 2022, the National Research Council of Thailand has provided support to our program and will join as a member of the executive board to provide policy guidance and direction of the program going forward. For Thailand, NASDA realized that embracing research and innovations is critical to uplift the competitiveness of the Thai industry and to grow our economy. And we see that a Tokyo Tech Annex would serve as a platform to stimulate research collaboration, utilizing the strength of both Tokyo Tech as an academic institution and NASDA as a research institute for the benefits of the companies or the industry at large. The Tokyo Tech and NASA Research Showcase is one of the activities which Tokyo Tech Annex has organized and NASA as a co-host. The purpose is to introduce the research or technology being performed or developed at both institutions or with their partners, those which have high potential to strengthen or enhance the capability of the industry. Today, the topic of the research showcase is automation, robotics, and intelligent system, which is aligned with one of the targeted sectors of technology and innovation in the Eastern Economic Corridor of Innovation, or EECI, that Professor Takada mentioned, located at Wang Jan Valley, Rayong Province. Where NASDA has established EECI ARI Police, ARI stands for Automation, Robotics, and Intelligent System, which is the title of the showcase today. ARI Police aims to promote technology development and technology localization, which corresponds to the need of the private and industrial sectors through R&D, testing, demonstration and intensive training in three focus areas, namely smart and sustainable manufacturing, smart agriculture and smart living. 
Presently, the construction of infrastructure of Aripolis, including Smart Manufacturing Center or SMC, alternative battery pilot plants, and connected and autonomous vehicle proving ground is in progress, where the SMC is almost completed. The center will be equipped with all necessary service components to support Thai manufacturing sector in their transformation to Industry 4.0. Alternative battery pilot plant, which will support the development of high performance batteries to strengthen Thailand energy security, will be completed in 2022, followed by the connected and autonomous vehicle or CAV, proving ground to be a regulatory sandbox for testing the CAV with the international standards to be completed in 2025. In addition, uh, the establishment of intelligent technology for mobility center is planning at EECI Aripolis. A number of NASA researchers and support staff will start to move into EECI around June this year, and we plan for the soft launch uh, later in the year. In this regard, uh, NASA would like to work with Tokyo Tech Annex to identify opportunities for collaborative research projects between Thai's Tokyo Tech partners and industries that support the development of EECI Aripolis. I hope you will gain lots of knowledge and see the opportunity from today's showcase. I look forward to seeing collaborative research and development at EECI in the future. As Professor Takada mentioned that some has already been started and get support through uh, eAsia program. Last but not least, uh, I would like to express uh, our deepest gratitude to our counterpart, Tokyo Tech, for today's research showcase. I wish uh, everyone safe and healthy and hope to see everyone in person uh, sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chadamas. Okay, then. I would like to welcome the first speaker, Professor Koichi Suzumori, uh, School of Engineering, Tokyo Tech. The, today's title is Soft Robotics Leading to a Small, a Smart Society and the Future. Then uh, Professor Suzumori, please go ahead. Thank, thank you. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm Koichi Suzumori. And uh, I will share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, thank you. And the title of The title of my talk is Soft Robotics Leading to Smart Society and the Future. I've been working on soft robots for a long time. And these are the examples of symbolic images of soft robots, which I'm aiming at. And you might think this picture, this picture is not, uh, not very academical. But I believe accepting this kind of irresponsibility to science is an essential idea of soft robotics. Okay, let me start with what soft robots. Uh, these are examples of soft ro robots which, uh, which were developed in my lab. And uh, as you can see here, soft robots have soft bodies, which realize shape adaptability and uh, gentle handling, for example. This slide shows the background of soft robotics. 
I believe uh, conventional robotics is based on the values of convention conventional engineering that speed, force, accuracy, and certainty. This results in great success in industries, as you know, but I'm afraid a current robot still cannot realize some performances in our daily life, which living creatures can do easily. For example, it's not easy for today's robot to hang a baby with gentle touch. Soft robotics can be said a new robotics based on the values of biological system, such as flexibility, adaptability, and ikangen. Uh, ikangen is a key word in my talk, and I will talk later. And many new researches on softness have been born recently in various fields, such as in mechatronics, material science, and computer science. An interesting point is that these technologies are bad technologies from the viewpoint of conventional robotics. Robot arm, which is easily deformed by the external road, is a bad mechanical design in conventional robotics. These materials are fragile and unstable, but materials. Recent AI returns different answer each time. They can be said a bad technology. However, these technology actually work well. Applying these soft, soft technology to the robotics we create a new academic discipline that's soft robotics. This is my basic idea on soft robotics. I reintroduced several soft robots using my works. Uh, this is my first soft actuator, FMA flexible micro actuator developed in 1986. It's made of fiber reinforced rubber and driven pneumatically. It has three internal chambers and uh, okay, it, it has three internal chambers and controlling the pressure in each chamber results in three degrees of freedom of motion, a pitch, yaw, and stretch. It can be used as softer manipulators and softer hand. As you can see here, they have shaped out shape adaptability and uh, work gently. This slide shows four examples of this actual application. This is a miniature hand. Each finger is two millimeters in diameter. Uh, it's turning a uh, contact lens. The control algorithm is very simple. The air pressure is controlled by the on-off valves, not by analog valves. As each finger has three internal chambers, the hand has nine chambers in total. So this hand is controlled only with, only with nine bit sequential pneumatic on off signals. Soft robots work very, uh, work with very simple ins instruction without complicated programming. This is a walking robot and this is a manta robot, manta swimming robot. It uses only two actuators, only two actuators you can see here, but they, the ray deforms very naturally with the interaction between the elastic body and the water. And generating the motion possibly is a big advantage of a soft robot. This FMA array was fabricated through 3D printing in 1994. 
This is a self-propelling colonoscope. Do you have the experience of colonoscope inspection? No? Uh, it's sometimes very painful for patient and for doctor, even for experienced doctors, inserting the scope into the large intestine is not very always easy because the large intestine is very flexible and has a complicated shape. So we have developed a self-propelling colonoscope. This is our prototype. Rubber tubes are wound around the scope and driven numerically. Do you understand how this works? We fabricate a small rubber tube, a six millimeter and 3.5 millimeter. It has three internal chambers and applying the air pressure in each chamber sequentially causes the elastic deformation like this. And we wind two rubber tubes in parallel, spirally around the scope, um, blue one and red one, spirally around the scope and delivering them with a half phase difference. Then it works like this. And this is a FME result. And this shows an inserting test using this model. And this is a view from the scope camera. And it, it moves, it works well in the model, as you can see here. Next, I will move to the next topic. Do you know the Macbeth muscle? Macbeth muscle? Do you know? It's a pneumatic rubber muscle originally invented in Germany in 1948. It's very old and well-known artificial muscle. It consists of rubber tube and braided cord around it. Applying air pressure into the tube makes, makes the muscle contor contract in the actual direction. While conventional Machiavelli muscles are several centimeters in diameter, we have achieved their miniaturization and mass production. Six years ago, I have established a startup, uh, Tokyo Tech startup venture company named S Muscle, and which has commercialized a thin Machiavelli muscle two to five millimeter in diameter. Okay, this video shows the manufacturing process in my work, factory, and these are the braiding machines. And you can see the, here the thin rubber tube here, and uh, the cords, cords are braided around it. We are weaving the muscle to realize active fabric. These two examples are contract, contracting fabrics. What's interesting is uh, these braided muscles show bigger contracting ratio than that of the original single muscle. It's very interesting. And uh, these two fabrics show the bending motion. They are applied to power assist wheels. Uh, please watch these two movies where two reporters are talking about the feeling of use. ね、で、アシストスーツを作ってみると。あ、すごい立ち上がりやすいですよ。あ、そうですか。はい。肩を持ち上げられる感じかなと思ったんですが、どっちかっていうとお尻を上げられるような感じですね。これあの硬いモー
もちろん重いんですよ重さはかかってくるんですけど<笑>この持ち上げる瞬間とかの,ああの腰とか足をサポートしてくれてますそうですよねどのくらいの負荷がかかるとか人の大きさだとか筋肉のつき方だとかいろんな条件があるんでそれに合わせてどういうふうにあのこの服を作ったらいいかっていうのをこれからやまだまだまだやっていかなきゃいけないんです。So we can start, you can start with your This is an application to muscle to musculoskeletal robot. We imitate the bone and muscle structures based on the human anatomy. What's interesting in this project is a similar structure results in similar properties. This robot shows several kinematic and dynamic properties similar to the human body. This robot has a very redundant mechanism. For example, one leg has six degrees of freedom of motion, but 40 independent muscles are working to drive one leg, a very redundant system. It would be difficult for conventional mortals to drive this kind of redundant mechanism because conventional mortals are too stiff to work in cooperation, but this muscle can do it because of their softness. This is another example, a 20 meter long arm. It has a small camera at the tip. This is the image. Uh, from the camera. This robot is made of helium gas filled balloons. And it, it has 20 joints. And this is a camera. And this is a muscle. And uh, this is a, a control panel. The robot enter, sorry. The robot enters this roof, this roof window to approach the, this, uh, this pipe. This is an image from the camera and you can see that the pipe. The arm negotiate the roof window to approach the pipe. The, the arm can contact the construction with no damage and it gets the image from the pipe. We can say the arm can find the approach path by itself after repeating the physical contact with the surroundings. Instruction from the operator is very simple. Just go ahead. This is very different from the conventional robotic approach. Conventional robotics would use a very stiff and heavy arm and the laser range finder to recognize the environment and the computer calculates the approach path in a very logical manner. But soft robotics work in very loose manner. Okay. Next, uh, I'll talk about the power soft robotics. I'm afraid some people might think that Soft robots ge generate only small force. But I'm afraid this idea is not correct. There are many examples in nature which show both power and flexibility. I believe that softness and power are independent concepts. And I believe we can develop powerful and soft robots. For this purpose, we are developing hydraulic, ma hydraulic machine muscle. The hydraulic ma muscle generates their force 10 times bigger than uh, pneumatic muscle. 
For example, this muscle is uh, 15 millimeter in diameter and generate about one ton contracting force. I will show two examples of power soft robot. This is a, this is a long arm, seven meter in length, which consists of contracting muscle and extending muscle. Changing the knitting angle of the blade cord result in the two types of muscle and extending and uh, contracting muscle. Combination of these two types generate big moment. This is very similar to the elephant trunk, where some muscle works to support the compressive stress and the other muscle supports the tensor stress to generate a big moment. This is our recent work. We are working with a giraffe anatomist and developing a giraffe robot. Giraffe neck is a typical example in nature, which shows flexibility and the power, power. Elephant trunk and giraffe neck gives us many ideas for power soft robotics. Next, I will talk about the ikangen, ikangen word. Ikage is a keyword in soft robot robotics. I believe soft ro robotics is a value changer in robotics. Soft robotics realize shape adaptability, back durability, passive force control, solid dispersion, gentle touch, and essential safety, and etc. However, these features are bad features from the viewpoint of conventional robotics, which has been seeking for force, speed, and accuracy. For example, robot, robot mechanism, which with low stiffness is generally bad in conventional robotics, while soft robotics accept it and use it to realize gentle works easily. I believe the essential idea of soft robotics is accepting ambiguity and uncertainty and using them to make robots work in appropriate manner. And we have an interesting Japanese word, ikage. This word has two opposite meaning. One is negative meaning ambiguous, uh, irresponsible, sloppy, unreliable. The other is a positive meaning, moderate, adaptive, uh, adaptable, appropriate, and suitable. What's interesting is the idea of ikage has been existing in nature and the industries since before. For example, soft body of weeping, weeping willow shows a toughness and allowing the copy error, copy error of DNA result in the evolution. And by giving the poor positioning accuracy, the robot sometimes work very well. And poor accuracy of eye position result in unique beard. As shown in these examples, I believe Ikangen concept of accepting ambiguity and uncertainty and using them to do in an appropriate manner is a very natural idea and uh, can be accepted in the future science and technology. Let me finish with the last slide. Uh, in the background of the, these Ikangen trends, I believe there is a historical meaning. In the past, Power, speed, and accuracy have been the most important for human being to survive and to grow the society. But I think these purposes have almost been achieved after agricultural revolution, industrial revolution, and IT revolutions. And the general gentleness and flexibility become much more important for a sustainable society. 
This shows the global population in the world. From the beginning of human, Homo sapiens, the population increased very slowly. But these, these are these are few hundred years, it suddenly jump, jumped up. I believe we are now at the historical turning point of science and technology. I believe this causes value change from the power and the accuracy. And I believe one of the typical new value can be Ikange. And uh, I believe that Soft robotics can be the pioneer creating this new value. Okay, thank you very much for the, your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Suzunori. And uh, yes, uh, at the moment, no questions from audience. One question from my side. I think uh, uh, materials to produce uh, such kind of soft robotics is important. And uh, when you plan some new movement or something, do you uh, plan to produce some new materials or are you, do you, are you trying to, you know, look for uh, some suitable materials from market? Yes, thank you very much for your question. So yes, material is a very important technology, the most important technology in software robotics. And uh, what in, um, in the pa pa past, uh, we, we don't use the uh, rubber or elastomer in robotics. We, use, we have used uh, very stiff and stable uh, materials, but, uh, and uh, we dislike, we, have, we disliked the unstable material, but uh, I believe the unstable material has a good, good po possibility, good potential to realize a new new soft robot which has a adaptable adaptable. For example, when the temperature increases, the unstable material turns uh, its uh, uh, property to protect the protect the body. Or uh, sometimes it uh, uh, turn to the nature after after uh, finishing the uh, uh, using the robot. So the materials which had been sort of the bad material can be the very potential material for soft robot. So functional material and uh, fragile material can be a great potential. And uh, I believe it, uh, the robotics can make the new market for that material. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice talk today. Thank you very much. Okay, then, uh, thank you very much. Okay, I'll move to the next speaker. Next speaker is uh, Associate Professor Takeshi Hatanaka, School of Engineering, Tokyo Tech. And today's title is Coordinated Control of Multiple Robot Drones. Hatanaka Sensei, please go ahead. Yes. Did you see my slide? Yes. Okay. okay. So thank you for the kind introduction. My name is Takeshi Hatanaka, a faculty of School of Engineering at, of course, Tokyo Institute of Technology. First of all, I would like to share my own short story about Thailand. I stayed in Thailand for two weeks with my friends about 20 years ago just after completing my bachelor degree. And then vi visit Chiang Mai, Pattaya, Ayutthaya, and of course, Bangkok. Then we borrowed some 
elephants. Not robotic elephants. Hatanaka sensei, sorry, I cannot hear you. Oh, really? Please wait. Do you hear me? あ、聞こえておりますあ、聞こえてますかはい、聞こえておりますはいえ、so please let me know if my microphone doesn't work so どうしよう <laughs> so uh, there, anyway then I had a very wonderful memories and I sincerely hope to come there again. Anyway, today I would like to talk about a part of our research work on coordinated control of multiple robots or drones. So please let, let me first introduce myself. My major is systems and control the same name as the name of my department. In particular, we are working on coordinated control of robots and so-called cyber-physical human system. Roughly speaking, coordination between a human and robots. We are working on these topics in collaboration with some partners in industry belonging to so-called super smart society promotion consortium launched in 2018 and through international collaborations with Italy, Spain, Germany, and the US. My group has 18 students, but here I would like to highlight only one bachelor student, Tampi Bato Kombik. Probably my pronunciation is not perfect, but he originally came from Thailand. Here, I would like to emphasize that the students in Thailand are really great. Actually, his performance is quite outstanding. For example, he will soon win an award from Japan Society of Mechanical Engineers for his outstanding academic performance. And moreover, he is also actively involved in other activities, for example, supporting students from Thailand who had some difficulties related to COVID-19 pandemic. For those activities, he won the Tokyo Tech Student Leadership Award last year. I'm really happy to supervise such a great student from Thailand. So anyway, in this talk, we consider a network of multiple robots as shown in these movies. The goal is to design a distributed control system that enjoys stable coordination of the robots. But what is distributed control? In distributed control, each robot in the network decides its own motion based only on the information of the neighbors connected by the network. The issue to be addressed here is to achieve coordination and this information constraint. Let me next present fundamental difficulties in the coordinated control of network systems. The left movie is a student experiment made for third year undergraduates in my department. The objective here is very simple, just to read the robot in the left to a specified position. And here, the, the third year 
study students are able to control the robot to the target position very smoothly like this. And this graph illustrates the time response of the robot position by the green line. Now we cannot find any unstable behavior. Let's then form a vehicle string using the same hardware and controller as the left. Then the followers take as a reference a point where a certain distance is open from the vehicle in front. Accordingly, these robots are networked. Then we see that these robots collide with each other. However, what is important here is not the collisions. This graph illustrates the velocity profiles of the robots, wherein we observe that the overshoots of the velocities are getting larger and larger as moving towards the forwards. Actually, this phenomenon explains about 70% of the traffic jam in highways. But what is important here is that networking brings instability and that this instability is invisible in control of a single level. On the other hand, in take, taking exactly the same strategy, there are examples that achieve great coordination as a result of acting on feedback of only neighbor's information, namely fish schooling and birds flocking. In particular, in the left, the fishes around the top of the group change their velocities to avoid a shock. But the impact of the velocity change does not propagate to the followers. Differently from the vehicle stream presented in the previous slide. The natural question here is what is the fundamental difference between these two. About 10 years ago, we worked out this phenomenon from the viewpoint of systems and control and found a principle. Accordingly, we could duplicate the buzz, buzz forking like behavior. It's a little bit hard to formally define the word of natural. In my personal opinion, the behavior is as natural as first fucking in the real world. Could you agree with me? Anyway, here we skipped all of the technical details, but uh, if you would be inter interested in the details, please refer to our book. Today, I'm sorry, I don't have much time. So through these basic researches, our group is now trying to tackle social issues. At least at a conceptual level, such coordinated control technology can be a key solution to super smart society because there it is required to coordinate or harmonize huge number of components connected by a network. To promote the work toward a super smart society, Tokyo Tech launched a new academy called Tokyo Tech Academy for Super Smart Society, as introduced by Professor Takada in the beginning. And this academy builds a variety of research and education fields on not only robotics, but also mobility, quantum computing and sensing, artificial intelligence, and so on. Among them, I'm in charge of a field called 
Robot to Sky, which is a robotic experiment platform enabling coordinated control of heterogeneous robots and drones. For example, we can easily implement the control algorithms that coordinate various robots as shown in this movie. The field is working not only for research, but also for education. We are providing students in the academy and engineers in the companies with the opportunities to learn state-of-the-art control technology. I would like to briefly introduce some experimental movies on the field. The top movie is a demo of so-called formation control. The three drones form and maintain a triangle formation while avoiding the obstacle. While the transparent drones, it's a little bit hard to identify, but they, they do not use any coordination. Then they violate the formation in the process of avoiding the obstacle. On the other hand, by using the coordinated control, we can maintain the formation. On the other hand, while developing novel autonomous control technology is important, many real missions require human interventions at various levels. In such a case, we need to coordinate or harmonize a network, including a human. Our group is also working on the topic, and the bottom movie shows an example of a human swarm TV with VL technology. Another typical example of coordinated control is cabbage control, whose objective is to deploy robots over the environment in order to optimize information sampling on the environment in the scenario of environmental monitoring. What is interesting in this movie is that the robots autonomously reconfigure the optimal configuration according to the environmental changes like robot failures. The attractive motion is generated by a simple logic of just letting robots track to the centroid of their own territories defined by so-called Voronoi diagram in computer science. So while cabbage control can lead robots to uh, the best optimal configuration, we sometimes wish to lead robots patrol the space efficiently, especially when the sensing radius of the robots is limited and the number of robots are few relative to the size of the space to be monitored. This patrolling motion is also generated by slightly modifying the control algorithm so that the importance on the field is dynamically updated based on the history of the coverage status. So, oh, oh, please wait. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I had a term. And of course, the control algorithm is applied to a network of drones with sensors looking down to the environment. We see that the drones monitor the environment while avoiding too much overlaps of the fields of view. 
which would enhance the mission efficiency as compared with the case of a single drone. Now, I would like to highlight a state-of-the-art control experiment in this line of research. Here, we coordinate three drones. After starting the movie, they start patrolling the environment in the same way as the movie in the previous slide. Now, the motivation of the patrol is to find a target object automobile here and survey the object. So the drone that detects the target stops patrolling and keeps monitoring the target. The other two drones continue patrolling, but their battery level are getting low. In order to avoid running out of the batteries, we add an additional specification that drones need to go back to the charging station before their batteries are exhausted. So the drone go back to the charging station. After landing, the battery level increases and it restarts, restarts patrolling once the battery is fully charged. On the other hand, the drone that, that uh, surveils the target also has to go back to the charging station. In this case, other drone that was patrolling starts surveying the target instead of this guy. With a state of the art control technology, these complex requirements can be realized with a single, very simple control logic. So far, we have presented some examples of coordinated control of the robots. But some of the audience may have thought this is far from social issues, in particular, super smart society. That's true. Among a variety of social issues, my main focus is, main focus is placed on the agriculture. Japan's agricultural industry is aging rapidly, and the agricultural population is decreasing. So upgrading the, the agriculture using current technology is an urgent issue. Similar concept has been pre uh, presented in Germany in the name of Agriculture 4.0. Our report mentions applications of robot technology to the agriculture, wherein the future agricultural robots should be small and electronically driven. More importantly, it is stated there that scaling up to the to the, uh, larger areas is not achieved by larger and faster machines, but by a swarm of similar and small robots cooperating with each other. This concept is completely the same as our work. So we started the work from the last year. First, we decided to tackle the problem problem of reconstructing a 3D map of farmland from aerial drone aerial images. In this scenario also, coordinating multiple drones is expected to enhance the efficiency of sampling images. Now the problem is similar to the environmental monitoring, but is it the same? The answer is no. To reconstruct a high quality map. What is this song? It's okay. Okay, I, I will, you know. I have to sample images at a point from rich viewing angles. So we presented a novel coordinated monitoring methodology termed angle aware coverage control, and it allows drones to take images from a variety of viewing angles where the wet is the monitor region and the blue is a well observed region. It can be, of course, implemented on the robot to the sky. 
We see that some drones get out of the field to sample images from outside of the field. If the viewing angles are not taken into account, they have no motivation to get out of the field because all points on the field can be monitored in, from inside of the field. We then reconstruct the map of the field from images acquired by the conventional method and the new angular wave method. We see that the present control method really contributes to enhancing the map quality. These are joint works with the researchers of CNR, a research institute in Italy. And they also brought a great opportunity for having an interdisciplinary collaboration. I mean, they introduced some researchers in the field of agriculture in Italy, and we started collaborations with them. They have a technology to construct a heat map of the trees in an apple orchard. And we amplified that the angry aware coverage is successfully integrated with their technology. Now it is time to embark on the uh, field experiment rather than the lab experiments presented so far. To this end, the aforementioned academy is building a new field on smart agriculture based on the ambitious concept of creating an actual field on the campus and having a much drone fly over it. After everything will be settled, we will implement our coordinated control algorithm over the field. So I would like to close my talk our group is working on coordinated control of multiple robots and drones towards a super smart society through industry academia, interdisciplinary, and international collaboration. I would be happy if I could have collaboration with all of you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Potanaka Sensei. I'm very sorry. Uh, there was a trouble in my headset, so I think everyone <laughs> could hear you clearly. Okay, any question from audience? Okay, one question. Uh, apart of drone, could we adapt that algorithm with another application? Uh, yes, yes. So actually, my, my colleague is working on the monitoring of the infrastructures using the same control technology. Actually, the infrastructures in Japan is also aging rapidly. So in order to avoid any risk, we have to constantly monitor the infrastructures. How, however, it requires large labor. So in order to enhance the efficiency, we are now trying to apply our control algorithm to the, that application. Can it be an answer? Okay. Thank you very much. Another question? Okay, Hatanaka Sensei, thank you very much for your yeah. nice talk. Thank you. Okay, so next speaker is Dr. Jatovat Rajuruang Gravin, uh, researcher, intelligent technology for mobility research team leader, rail and modern transport. Uh, research Center, NASTA. Today's title is Localization of Autonomous Vehicles in Thailand. So Dr. Roger, please. All right, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen.
so everyone can see my screen, right? So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jotuat Rachuan Labin, and uh, I'm with uh, uh, Rail and Modern Transport Research Center uh, at NASDA. So I'm a uh, senior researcher and a, a research team leader in the uh, intelligent technology for um, mobility research team. So today title is, uh, of, of my talk is uh, localization of autonomous vehicle technology in Thailand. So uh, basically this is, uh, would be a quick overview of uh, what we are doing over at the, uh, uh, my research center at uh, NASDA. So uh, my background is in uh, robotics and control as well, and also a little bit of signal processing. So uh, I have been doing this field of work for quite a while now, and uh, I'm recently focused uh, focusing on the uh, topic of uh, autonomous vehicle technology. So uh, as you may have already known uh, at NASDA, we, we work, work with uh, academia, but we are also doing research and development. And our main objective is to uh, create a, a new uh, industry in Thailand. So this is kind of a background of why we're doing this. So uh, as you may have already known that uh, the intelligent uh, system, intelligent uh, mobility technology is uh, kind of a, an emerging technology everywhere in the world. But in Thailand, we kind of, uh, work heavily in uh, automotive industry. And this is the trend that is changing the landscape of automotive industry. So uh, at NASDA, we, we kind of uh, want to uh, create infrastructure, building uh, human resources and bringing all the uh, policy making and government agencies together to working towards uh, building this uh, new technology, new industry in Thailand. So let me start with uh, kind of a quick to the point that the reason that we are doing this uh, autonomous vehicle technology as from this slide, you can see that there are so many components to this uh, autonomous vehicle technology development. So uh, this is kind of a, a groundwork that we have been working at NASDA. So uh, we can see that there are so many components to, to this and uh, we have component and suppliers. That's the important aspect of developing in uh, intelligent transport technology, mobility technology. So. That's one important aspect. And uh, for NASA and universities in Thailand, we're can, we can work together doing the, the core technology development of let's say uh, computer vision, centrifusion and AI that can be applied to uh, autonomous vehicle technology development. But, that's just uh, two components and there are more components to this as i mentioned we kind of uh, work with the uh, the government agencies so that uh, we can accommodate the uh, the application of uh, intelligent mobility technology in thailand so uh, as you as you know the uh the public road in Thailand, we require some kind of a driver's license to be able to operate the vehicle on our pub public road. So in order for the autonomous vehicle to be able to operate on our public road, we, we need to somehow address the issue of 
this laws and regulation with the agencies, the Ministry of Transport, so that we can somehow come up with some kind of a uh, regu regulatory sandbox or something so that we can start working with kind of a testing the autonomous technology on our public road. So that's not just the technology that we develop uh, in-house at NASDA or with our partners, but that would also enable the, uh, the technologies from overseas, the existing technology that can come into Thailand and kind of uh, 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 do a process with the testing and regulation so that they can somehow uh, do business in, in Thailand. So that's, that's uh, the big picture of this uh, value chain of autonomous vehicle. So now coming to this, we uh, at uh, our research center, this is kind of a activity that we have been doing. So uh, over here in Thailand, we kind of have a strong uh, automotive industry and we kind of encourage our local uh, local local company so that they can uh, move from just doing the framework or the body of the uh, vehicles they, they, they can uh, they can go further into a more of a technic technical point of view in order to kind of uh, adopt this autonomous vehicle technology into their uh, their kind of arsenal. So this is our good partner that we are currently working with. We work in, we are working with uh, Chilangkorn University, the Department of Science Service and the Asian Institute of Technology with, with our uh, private partner, the uh, Panats Assembly. So we are working together and this is the project that we have uh, government funding secure and uh, the, the project is uh, being conducted right now. So we are in the process of uh, building this kind of a shuttle pod uh, with uh, autonomous driving capability of level three. So this is a two year project uh, and uh, we, we are currently working on this. Uh, that's uh, that's the phase two of uh, the autonomous vehicle development in Thailand. So, uh, a little bit of background: we kind of uh, did a feasibility study of this autonomous vehicle technology uh, study with uh, our partner, uh, which is a. a property development companies are called uh, Century. So we kind of started with the idea that in order for the technology to uh, prosper, we need to have this, this kind of a triangle model. We have a uh, user at one end and the operator uh, at the other end. And also the other end of the triangle is the technology developer. So we, we kind of uh, uh, study this, this model within the, the, the area of this uh, private property. So we start with something small. We start with a, a, a golf cart, an EV golf cart, and we install the uh, sensors and uh, compute, computational system uh, on top of this, this uh, platform so that we have some kind of a a working uh, level three autonomous uh, sh shuttle working inside this 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 gated community called uh, T seventy seven with a sensory. So that's our uh, preliminary project that we did back in twenty nineteen 
2020. So it has been uh, over, over a year now. So we have now moved to our uh, phase two. So that's the idea. We kind of, we started small and then we moved uh, a little bit further to something kind of a bigger. So now we, uh, we moved from the golf, uh, golf cart, EV golf cart to our own platform. So that's the reason why we work closely with our partner, the private partner, the company. So we are in the process of building this uh, EV platform. And the idea is that we have our own uh, platform. We built from ground up and uh, we're going to kind of uh, transfer the autonomous driving technology from that, that previous project, the golf cart project on, on, on top to this, uh, the EV shuttle that we kind of are uh, uh, developing right now. So this is kind of uh, the, the, the cap of the, the final prototype and uh, we are in the process of building the prototype and it, 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 it's, it has already completed at about uh, 60 to 70 percent. So uh, maybe after we finish the thing, then I can update with the, the finished product, finished prototype. So uh, the idea is that we will kind of uh, uh, transfer the technology uh, and we kind of uh, make this technology uh, available in Thailand. So uh, it's not that we try to compete with the big auto uh, company in the world, but we, we see that in order for the uh, autonomous driving technology to be able to uh, uh, adopt that into the context of Thailand uh, road envir environment, we need some, we need to somehow develop the, uh, the technology that, that is suitable for the road conditions in Thailand. So as the uh, government agencies, that kind of uh, our objective to kind of uh, uh, prepare the environment and everything so that uh, once everything is ready, then we can have a, uh, this technology uh, apply in, on the public roads of Thailand. So that's the idea. And the reason we doing this kind of a, a shuttle pod, autonomous shuttle pod and something like this is because that we see that in Thailand uh, with our current public transportation system, we need some something that uh, that is called uh, first and last mile connectivity. So uh, if you imagine having a, a BTS train line and then we connect uh, from the main line to, to offices, to housing areas and so on with this kind of technologies, that, that's the, the gap that we see that kind of a, uh, an opening that uh, people can uh, fit into in order to start this kind of a, a new business. So that won't be competing with the the current uh, passenger vehicle uh, technology that uh, the big auto companies that are working on right now. So uh, on this slide, let me show a, a little bit of uh, video from uh, the previous project, the phase one that we did over at the T77. So uh, this autonomous golf cart is uh, working 
on the uh, the lidar technology. So basically, we work on uh, mapping of the HD map of the area, and then we use real time uh, uh, localization of uh, 3D lidar. So the the golf cart itself knows where it is, and then with the assistance of the uh, GPS technology and uh, uh, and signal processing, we have somehow uh, we have some kind of a pre pre planned trajectory so that uh, it services the area. So this area, this is a gated community. So in, in this area, there are uh, condominiums and also uh, dental hospital and uh, international school. So that's what we did with our phase one. So we, we now move on to the phase two. So this is a, a little bit of uh, the, the test that we did over at the Thailand Science Park, the, the headquarter of uh, NASTA. So this, this was during the COVID pandemic, uh, April 2020. So uh, there was nobody around. So we took the op opportunity to test the, uh, the autonomous golf cart uh, on uh, our campus. So we can see that uh, this is the LIDAR map of the, uh, the golf cart and we have a pre-planned trajectory for, so that the vehicle will kind of a follow. So we have a 3D real-time uh, LIDAR sensor and it's doing the uh, localization of the autonomous vehicle and then we have that information that, that information fed to the computer and then the computer does the real-time control of the uh, steering and driving. So uh, let me skip this. And this is another test that we did with the uh, parking lot scenario. So uh, the important thing about this uh, autonomous driving technology development is that we, uh, as the NASDA, we have this uh, EECI area that we kind of uh, develop. And uh, so within this area, the main focus would be the uh, autom automatic and uh, robotics and automation. So uh, one, one of the fields uh, is also the modern transport uh, ecosystem. So this is the kind of a projected uh, activities that will be conducted over at EECI campus. So uh, with this uh, autonomous vehicle technology that we are working on, it would be uh, very crucial that we have some kind of a, a sandbox so that we can uh, test the system with within the real world scenario. So this is what we kind of envision that uh, the EECI will be a living lab for the autonomous vehicle uh, testing. So uh, this is the map of the EECI campus and we kind of have a plan that we're going to be servicing this, this uh, yellow route uh, here in this ECI, we will be uh, testing the the our autonomous uh, shuttle, the the phase two that I mentioned. So this is the uh, the vision that we have with the ECI living lab, uh, and apart from the physical testing with the autonomous system, we kind of uh, uh, have a, a collaborative uh, project going on right now with uh, Taiwan uh, Nora Labs. So uh, we kind of are working on the, the computer simulation of uh, 
autonomous driving technology and autonomous driving testing. So uh, we kind of uh, have a building proving ground built at the our EECI campus by this is by Department of Science Service. So it will be able to uh, perform the testing of the autonomous driving function. So, but as you can see, this is a, a, uh, a limited space and it can uh, do certain number numbers of uh, testing per day. So we can see that it's kind of a very limited. So in order to expand that cap capability, uh, Anasta, we will be working toward uh, building the uh, digital twin simulation of this uh, CAV proving ground so, so that we can also uh, work on algorithm development of uh, autonomous driving and also testing of the essential uh, autonomous driving scenario within the simulated environment first. And so that later we can select certain uh, amount of uh, critical scenarios to be tested on the physical proving ground. So that's the uh, activity that we are uh, working on right now. So this is kind of a vision that uh, we have. So. Uh, we are working on this pilot project of uh, autonomous uh, shuttle development, autonomous driving technology development. And we are also working on building the environment so that uh, the uh, business, the industry that is related to this intelligent mobility can thrive in the future in Thailand. So uh, I guess this is, that's it for my uh, presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Jarot And one question from the audience. Uh, for the GPS, does it need to connect with internet? internet? If well, yes, does it have any problems with delay? Well, the GPS itself does not need the internet connectivity to be able to function. So uh, with the GPS unit, uh, we call it a, a GNSS and that's the uh, uh, usage utilization of the global uh, satellite system. So the, the, the unit itself is able to provide the uh, with accurate uh, coordinate of the the real time uh, reading from from this unit, so it does not really necessarily needs the internet connectivity to be able to function. But uh, for the internet connectivity, we we kind of need that for kind of a user interface. So. Uh, with, for for example, with the the, the project with the T seventy seven, we have some kind of a mobile application for the users, so that they can kind of a uh, it's 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 like a right healing application, but for that limited space that we are operating that we operated on. So uh, I guess. The, the, the internet connectivity is for some other functionality. And I guess that's another question. Oh, do, do I have time for this yes. Q&A? Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, Thank you, Totsapan. He's a student with uh, Thais Tokyo Tech program. And uh, the question, let's say, number one, I would like to confirm my understanding of the final goal of the autonomous vehicle in phase two. Will it be operated 
on the road sharing with other vehicles? So uh, this is a good question. Uh, when I mentioned the, the work with the, uh, the Ministry of Transport that kind of are in parallel with this current project. So let's just say that our, uh, our final objective, we want to be able to somehow operate the autom autonomous vehicle on the public road of Thailand. So but this is, this is kind of a pilot project that we are working on. So for the time being, it's illegal to operate uh, a vehicle on public road of Thailand without uh, a driver. So that's the reason that we kind of uh, uh, do the living lab sandbox testing over at EECI's. That, that's the that's that's the idea so we want to reach the eventual goal of being able to operate autonomous vehicle on public road of thailand so that's that's the goal that we are working towards uh, uh, I, I i think i i answered that question and number two i observed that the wi-fi is used for the command center in card av is there any problem regarding the interference from other Wi-Fi users and how to overcome such problem? That's also a good question. So Wi-Fi is a, uh, let's say it's a, a stable infrastructure, but one thing that Wi-Fi is not good at is that it has limited coverage. So for that, we need some, some kind of a cellular, cellular uh, network with 4G and 5G. So, uh, I would say that uh, Wi-Fi wouldn't be just the sole uh, network connectivity that we have on this kind of autonomous vehicle. Uh, it would be kind of a complementary with 4G, 5G net uh, cellular capability. And uh, number three, I also observed that the GNSS will be used for the vehicle location in phase two. How do you overcome the satellite blockage problem? This is also a good question. Well, at, for, from phase one, we noticed that the uh, signal from uh, GNSS is intermittent. It means that we cannot have a reliable signal for 100% of the time, depending on the uh, weather condition of that day. That's one thing. So. It is important that we, for the, the, the critical component of driving and safety, we do not rely on this uh, GNSS signal. That's one thing. So uh, to answer this question, yes, the, the, the blockage problem is real and we overcome this by having some kind of a backup system so that we don't rely on the signal from satellite 100% of the time. We make use of the, uh, the IMU. So we need to also do some kind of a, a mapping and uh, estimation of the, the current location of the autonomous vehicle so that we don't 100% rely on the GNSS. That's how we overcome this blockage problem. All right, thank you for the questions. Well, it, it keeps coming. Do I have time for this? Yes, one more question. Can you answer briefly? Uh, there are some limitations. Well, rain. yeah, there, there are some limitations, as I mentioned. Rainy day, or at night, night wouldn't be a problem, but rainy day, the, we wouldn't get a signal from the satellite. That's the limitations. Okay, Dr. Jato, thank you very much for- your Thank you, thank okay. you very much. Thanks for having me. Okay, the last speaker is a special appointed associate professor, Kazuki Maruta, Academy for Super Smart Society, Tokyo Tech. Today's title is Next Generation ITS for Safe Automated Driving. 
Hey, Marcos, yes, please go ahead. Okay, uh, so let me share my screen. Uh, do you see my screen? That's right. Yes. Okay, thank you uh, for uh, introduction. Me. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Kazuki Maruta from uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology, Japan. And so uh, I belong to the Academy for Super Smart Society. So uh, thank you very much today for giving such a great opportunity to uh, share uh, our recent activities. So in my presentation today, uh, I'd like to present uh, some uh, field trials toward the safe automated driving using the uh, communication. So, so uh, it was, uh, my uh, actually my research background is uh, communication side. So uh, so now we are trying to combine the communication and then safe automated driving, especially for using the millimeter wave band. Okay, so let's start with some background. Uh, the current uh, transportation system, uh, as shown here, relies heavily on the human cognitive function. So most of the uh, causes of traffic accidents are human error. So there is a need to develop the uh, system that supports uh, safe, safe, more safe uh, driving. It also uh, includes uh, automated driving. Currently, uh, ITS, uh, Intelligent uh, Transport System, is uh, known to support or improve uh, driving convenience by using DSRC. Uh, it means a dedicated short range communication. So it provides uh, traffic congestion the information and also uh, it can assist in payment called uh, ETC. Uh, Electric toll gate collection in Japan. Yeah. And also, uh, 2015 uh, 15, uh, service, uh, advanced service called ITS Connect was launched in Japan. It is provided by the uh, Toyota uh, automobile company in Japan. So, this is the world's uh, first safety assistance service using the communication, DSRC communication. This, uh, this system allows you to the situation in the uh, oncoming lane uh, when you are turning right in the section. And also allows the when a vehicle uh, approaches in the intersection, or uh, uh, it can also allow the pedestrian, pedestrian is coming behind the oncoming vehicle. So these systems uh, to provide information so that uh, people can recognize and then reflect it in that their driving control. But uh, it should be noted that uh, it is still built on the current transportation infrastructure. So uh, due to the limitation of human uh, cognitive function, recognition, it is difficult to uh, completely eliminate uh, such traffic accidents. So for further safe driving, and we need to consider the drastic uh, reconstruction. Yeah, so it's time to rethink uh, current transportation infrastructure. So, and so uh, in recent years, uh, automated driving has also been positioned as an uh, important uh, topic for realizing, realizing the uh, coming super smart society. So main point of today's uh, presentation is to discuss uh, safer or uh, driving support, uh, so including the automated driving using the uh, advanced uh, sensing and also V2X communication. Yeah. In, uh, the V2X uh, has a so wider sense. It includes uh, uh, ITS, next generation ITS. So legacy infrastructure, infra so legacy infrastructure will be replaced with the roadside unit, RSU, which have uh, extended sensors, such as uh, LiDAR, light detection and ranging, and then uh, high definition cameras, and then communication means uh, to transfer these sensor data or between the uh, cars on uh, pedestrians. Here are these extended sensors, uh, produce a uh, uh, large traffic amount. 
So、uh, it cannot be supported in the current communication systems such as、uh, DSRC. So we conducted、uh, research on exploiting、uh, millimeter wave band communication, which is in,、uh, capable of the transmitting huge amount of data.、Uh, So,、uh, and also,、uh, it can also attain the low latency transmission. Yeah, so, millimeter, we,、uh, we are thinking、uh, it millimeter wave band has a good compatibility, compatibility with、uh, use cases related to the、uh, autom automated driving that realize real time、uh, communication. Yes, so, first, this is thread shows the、uh, levels of、uh, automation. So,、uh, there are six levels for,、uh, towards、uh, automated driving. So, currently,、uh, level three, automated driving is commercialized、uh, in Japan、uh, under the limited condition. So, limited condition means,、uh, uh, for example,、uh, in the situation the car is driving in the highway, but、uh, traffic, traffic is congested, traffic jam. Then, uh, vehicle is running at the not so high speed. For example, around the 10 km per hour is not、uh, very slow. In this case,、uh, automated driving can be activated. So, it is so currently, it's so,、uh, condition is very limited. So, yeah, so level zero. Uh, from level zero to level two are、uh, uh, categorized as uh, uh, driving assistance, safe, or,、uh, safe driving assistance. And also, levels, from level three to level five is、uh, categorized as、uh, automated driving.、Yes. So now, uh, uh, many automobile companies or in the worldwide are trying to realize uh, uh, fully automated driving,、uh, level four or level five. So, its demonstration experiment toward level four is now ongoing. Yeah, this is as、uh, presented from the、uh, previous presentation from the a z u r a Gambin Sensei. Okay.、Oh. Ah, sorry. Okay. So, this is a、uh, uh, component of automated driving. Basically, it has、uh, three components. One is the hardware,、uh, and the sensor, and actuator.、Uh, so, camera, LIDAR,、uh, radar, radar.、Uh, it acts uh, like an、uh, eye of human. And so, can control an area network、uh, which connects the say, sensor data to actuator, weight, and the pedals. In software, uh, uh, I introduced this、uh, open source software as、uh, Robot OS and also Autware. Autware is uh, uh, on, also an open source uh, platform. Uh, uh, it is working on the Robot OS.、Yes. Then, technical components are、uh, uh, also an important、uh, part in the automated driving. What is the localization and the mapping? So,、uh, It r e c o g n i z e s what、uh, we are. Then, path planning and tracking is、uh, where to go. And object detection and avoidance is also、uh, essential technique to avoid the accident. So,、uh, this is a, a basic uh, function to realize、uh, automated driving. But、uh, to realize more safe、uh, automated driving, uh, its uh, function should be more.、Uh, Improved. So currently, so these, these sensors are mounted on the own vehicle. Then, so vehicle can also sensing range for automatic driving is limited. So, for the,、uh, this sensor is mounted on the own vehicle. So,、uh, vehicle cannot recognize uh, uh, only the, can recognize only that vehicle C. So, Here, we'd like to、uh, combine the communication to share the、uh, sensor data information.、Uh, then, so the vehicle can expand its、uh, sensing range. It will com contribute to more safe、uh, automated driving. Yes, so it is the V2X. So,、uh, for towards higher automation,、uh, 
now we are thinking about to combine the communication and automated driving. Vehicle are connected to all of the things, uh, vehicles, people, pedestrians, networks to share the information to extend the, uh, how to say, uh, recognize, recog recognize uh, more wide range. But uh, as I said, uh, these extended sensors uh, requires a higher data rate for communication. For example, uh, camera, uh, uh, for example, uh, high definition ones, 4K, it requires needs uh, 70 mega BPS. And also LiDAR, um, its specific specification is now uh, improving uh, better and better. And then country, so high definition ones, 100, and 28 layer sensor. It needs the uh, transmission rate of uh, 160 mega BPS. So it cannot support, so the current DSRC or VTX communication specification cannot support, cannot support such a high uh, transmission data rate. So um, we are focusing on the, uh, to apply the millimeter wave band communication for higher, high capacity communication. So what is millimeter wave? So it is definition is uh, basically from uh, frequency band from the 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz band. So uh, currently uh, most of uh, wireless communication systems use uh, microwave band uh, around the uh, several gigahertz one or two, because this microwave band is uh, very useful to uh, mobility, so it can cover the wide area. So this frequency band are uh, mainly assigned to the uh, traditional cellular systems, 3G, 4G, or wireless uh, Wi-Fi. So, so nowadays, so there is no more available resources to allocate. So now, uh, in the system, uh, on the 5G or uh, later, so frequency bands are shifting to the higher band. So in the 5G, sub-6, around the 4 or 5 gigahertz band, you did here, and then 5G also you uh, did a millimeter wave band. It is uh, 28 gigahertz. And the next generation wireless run uh, called the YGIG, uh, in 60 gigahertz band is assigned, which can use the more wide uh, bandwidth. Uh, it can achieve the uh, gigabit gigabit per, sec per second class uh, transmission rate. But uh, challenges using millimeter wave band is, is uh, it's limited uh, coverage. So higher frequency band, uh, its transmission range is reduced, shrinked. Uh, so uh, main challenge to use a millimeter wave, wave band is uh, how to create the effective its utilization. So we are focusing on the uh, VTX communication to use uh, such millimeter wave band. Okay, so now uh, in the Tokyo Tech, uh, we are constructing the uh, say, uh, field experiment test of it. It called the uh, smart, super smart society, smart mobility R and D uh, research and education field. In this field, we are deploying the beyond the 5G heterogeneous wireless network. So it has uh, two kind of uh, wireless network. One is a uh, one gig based roadside unit sensor network. So this roadside unit RSU has uh, uh, 60 gigahertz uh, wide gig uh, antenna and then high definition, high definition camera and then LiDAR. So this is uh, now uh, four sites are deployed currently. And another one is uh, a private 5G network. It is provided by the uh, Lacte Mobile. So uh, currently this uh, two site at point is now uh, available. So it also has a uh, uh, sub six uh, band and also millimeter wave 
28 gigahertz band. Then uh, now we are plan planning to uh, expand its coverage area to in the Okayama campus. Then it is these uh, base stations are connected to the uh, here, yeah, some uh, room in the Okayama campus. So as data is once uh, say gathered to the edge server. So each server can also uh, be the deployed some uh, application server to uh, install or deploy the more uh, real time application. And so we have the two automated vehicles. One is a small electric car and so one is a uh, hybrid car. It, uh, we can drive uh, outside the campus. Now, so in this, using this field, we are now testing the automated driving and also V2X communication. Okay, so uh, I will introduce some uh, activities uh, from now. So one is uh, edge computing uh, detection uh, using the roadside unit. So as I said, uh, so this camera mounted on the roadside unit, uh, its streaming video is, uh, say, uh, gathered, transferred to the edge server. Then this edge server detects the uh, edge object, uh, pedestrian and the car, uh, yeah, and also. So, so this is a network structure. And uh, then RSU has also function the backholing using the millimeter wave band. So it can organize a localized uh, wireless network. Uh, it cannot, uh, how to say, uh, reach to the internet. So here uh, the challenge is how to reduce the uh, uh, data traffic for the uh, video streaming. So in, uh, in the practical phase, uh, there are lots of cameras uh, installed around the city. In this, but in this case, so uh, large amount, huge amount of traffic will be occurred for video streaming. So we need to reduce such uh, kind of, uh, traffic. Uh, so it is one, one challenge. And this is another demo. Uh, it's, uh, uh, let's say, uh, advanced traffic mirror using the millimeter wave transmission. So the scene of uh, beyond the corner is captured using the roadside camera, and this uh, image is transmitted to the vehicle using the millimeter wave transmission. So the driver can see the uh, scene uh, beyond the corner using uh, this monitor. So this, the, Movie on the right side also show the uh, this demonstration with the automated driving. So here, the RSU is located here, and then in this case, uh, LiDAR point card data and the camera image is transmitted to the vehicle. Yeah, it verifies the uh, uh, effectiveness of millimeter of transmission. So this is uh, uh, say, uh, another demonstration using of the cooperative perception. Cooperative perception means uh, uh, say, to extend the uh, let's say, uh, sensing region using the uh, VTS communication to share the uh, sensor data of other roadside units or vehicles. Here is a, a 3D point cloud map of the Tokyo Tech Okayama campus. And then vehicle will start from here to running. Then uh, roadside units are located here. And then it also has a LiDAR sensor. So this LiDAR point cloud is uh, shared to vehicle using the backholing and also uh, accessing. So both of them is a millimeter wave band. Start the movie. The vehicle is planning to start from here. The point cloud data. So this red circle shows the point cloud. It is in, uh, obtained from the own vehicle. And this green point cloud uh, obtained from the LiDAR uh, RSU 
uh, transmitted to the vehicle. So this vehicle can uh, recognize uh, uh, let's say, uh, what is happened in the beyond corner, the wide coverage. Uh, yes. This is also the demonstration uh, to see through the uh, corner. It is not automated driving, but uh, safe uh, driving assistance for human. So uh, this is also an uh, example of the sensor fusion of camera and LiDAR. So RSU is located here and seeing the beyond the corner. And then this uh, camera and LiDAR data is transmitted to the vehicle using the millimeter wave communication. Then uh, this vehicle also has a, a computing unit. Then it uh, combines the uh, uh, camera image and um, LiDAR point cloud to make the more realistic uh, vision. It is then transmitted to the AR glasses. So this is also a demonstration from the uh, AR glasses view. So this is the uh, point cloud uh, and then combined with the camera image. Uh, it is then overlaid on the uh, AR glass view. <laughs> it is a little bit difficult to see, but we can maybe you can see that some pedestrians coming here. So it's not uh, uh, say so it is because the uh, uh, resolution of LiDAR is not so enough. So we are now uh, thinking about replacing it more high resolution LiDARs. This is also the one uh, demonstration of blind spot visualization for safe driving. If this is a uh, Another demonstration for the uh, next generation uh, intersection traffic systems. So it is an uh, indoor experiment using small robots, but uh, we are now planning to do this experiment using the uh, automated driving car. So uh, this concept is to remove the uh, analog traffic lights so, uh, so intersection is controlled by the uh, some controller. The idea is the first robots uh, transmit the position and the speed information to the control PC. Then uh, this control PC uh, calculates the uh, optimal uh, moving speed, then feedback to them. So the video on the left side uh, shows the uh, uh, traditional uh, intersection system using the traffic light. So each robot uh, often stops, it will cause a uh, traffic jam. And the movie in the uh, right side shows the uh, uh, centralized uh, control using the big to infrastructure with to eye communication. The speed of each robot is uh, controlled in a centralized manner. So each robot uh, smoothly across the intersection without crash. So it will uh, ex expect it to improve the uh, efficiency of uh, traffic. Okay, so this is uh, the, my fin final uh, demonstration. So let me conclude uh, my, my presentation. So uh, today uh, I uh, presented the potentiality of V2X with millimeter wave for safe automated driving, and then uh, showed uh, some experimental demonstrations. And the future challenges, um, now uh, we have de uh, developed the uh, Beyond 5G non-stand alone network. It really uh, launches uh, this week. So we'll try to test uh, something uh, it's, uh, to verify that it's performance. Then uh, finally, we will integrate or orchestrate uh, this 5G network and then 
we meet up with uh, YGIG network and creates the uh, heterogeneous uh, network platform for super smart society or super mobility, uh, smart mobility or smart city. Okay, uh, so uh, we have some, what's it, a super smart society, uh, this field, we have the, some SNS account, so please visit and then show the uh, our recent uh, demonstration or activities. Okay, thank you for your attention. Uh, it will conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marita Sensei. It's a very interesting talk. Well, at the moment, no question from the audience. One question from my side. Uh, you are now doing a kind of field test inside in, in the campus. Mm. And uh, in the future, when you, we go out from the campus, can we use the existing infrastructure like uh, like the mobile? Uh, yes. So yeah, we are planning to uh, do ex do some demonstration outside the campus, but uh, but it requires uh, some uh, yeah, as say, as you said, the five uh, G network. So um, it can just you know, limited area, for example, the uh, uh, around the uh, what do you say, gate or uh, Okama station around the area, but it, it will be possible. And so we are planning to do the demonstration outside the campus. Yes. And uh, as far as I know, millimeter wave have very excellent uh, straightness. But uh, on the other hand, uh, very weak to obstacles, mm -hmm. so like a big buildings or uh, something. Is there any uh, strategy to solve such kind of you know, weak point? Ah, yes, thank you for your question. Yeah, as you said, uh, uh, as you know, the uh, millimeter wave is uh, not good for the uh, some uh, obstacles. So uh, we are considering about to uh, let me say uh, cover the area using the various kinds of wireless communication. So it also includes a uh, uh, 5G or 4G, and then uh, yeah, uh, also Wi-Fi is also uh, can be included to uh, make the heterogeneous network. In this case, so transmission rate is limited, so. Uh, now also we are considering about so how to manage the data traffic to uh, reduce, reduce the traffic amount or uh, make the optimal uh, how to say uh, traffic route traffic pass. Yes. Okay. One question from the audience: Can this system? be applied to use with the uh, virtual impaired? Visual, virtual. Visually impaired. Visually oh. impaired, sorry. Use with the visually. Uh, I'm not sure about. Shikaku Shogai Sha. Ah, OK. Thank you. Arigatouzaimasu. Uh, eto. Yes, it is so uh, effective effective uh, applied uh, such uh, kind of people uh, because uh, uh, if the, this uh, automation is realized by using the uh, BTS communication, so we need to see the, uh, I would say, uh, make attention to the other side uh, in visually. So we could our system uh, supports all of driving. So, yeah, it is also in this case maybe uh, maybe level four or level five uh, fully automated driving, so people can not uh, people uh, do not need to uh, make notice to the driving. So it is also applied to the uh, visually impaired people. Yeah. Does that answer the question? <laughs> Thank you very much. For your Thank, you. Thank you. Very much.
So, closing remarks. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all the speakers. So, could you show up again? Could you turn on your camera for the speakers? Yes, thank you very much for the interesting talk today. Okay, then uh, if, uh, for audience, thank you for joining us today. And we will email the link to the questionnaire soon. And please answer it and you will get the password to today's materials. And should you wish to uh, collaborate with us, or if you have further questions, please feel free to contact to Tokyo Tech and Bangkok and NASTA. You can communicate in Thai and in English. And Tokyo Tech Research Showcase is an annual event, and we are planning the next showcase for uh, 2023. Okay, thank you again for all the speaker and, and uh, audience. See you again next year. Thank you very much. Goodbye.